at the United Kingdom case, not because it's of great size compared to the United States, or because I think we've done anything clever, but because it is broadly and on the surface very similar, and there are a lot of real similarities, although some very real differences, as I hope to illustrate. Um, and so you have the advantage of looking at a runner in the mile race who's just ahead of you and you're in the slipstream. You may not fancy his running style, he may not be going to win the race. Um, but, but he is ahead of you and if there's a fault in the track which you keep stumbling in, it's useful to see if you're a second runner and about to win the race. So that's why I'm going to concentrate a bit on the British situation. And of course you know a lot about your own situation anyway, but to give you something to judge it against. And then if I may, to compare the uh, United Kingdom and the British situations uh, trying to illustrate some of these fundamental differences as I see them. So to start with, uh, and then I will give you my assessment of, as a humble Iranian, as a very student economist, of uh, the chances of success. Um, basically the background is, as we all know it, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, that the West, as a civilization, is in trouble. <coughs> I mean, it's in pretty darn severe trouble. And when we are courageous enough to either turn the headlights on or open the curtains in the morning and look out at reality, it's a pretty painful sight in most of the countries in the West, with rising crime rates, standards in general tending to drop, um, productivity problems, threats from defense point of view and, you know, whether we can meet them. And of course, the key one is whether we don't just have the ability to meet the challenges of the 1980s anymore, but whether we indeed even have the will to solve the problems and these challenges that face us. Now, I believe that that is absolutely crucial, the development of the will, because I think the ability in the end really only comes from the will. I mean, if you were coming in from outer space in a spaceship, you were looking for a place to land, you might choose a place like Brazil. I mean, dusky maidens on the beautiful beaches, fruit trees, bananas growing on the trees, and, you know, infrared would show you lots of marvelous natural resources, everything, marvelous climate, everything. But just look at the economic success of, of Brazil. When compared to two heaps of granite, one of them with icing on the top, I mean, Japan and Switzerland. Those two countries have been made out of the will of people. And they have very few natural resources. And so to me, the survival of the West and its ability to meet these challenges of the 1980s depends on its will, the gendering of a will to meet them, rather than just an ability. I also believe in the old adage that there are no bad ships, but just bad officers. And therefore, I believe that leadership is absolutely key in, in reviving this will uh, to compete. It's key in the survival or success of a family, of a company, of a regiment, of any group of individuals, of a nation, even of a civilization, as I hope to illustrate. And yet, whilst leadership is key, we have government seemingly everywhere particularly in the United Kingdom, much more than the United States. It's all around us. I mean, everywhere is government sort of interfering in this, interfering in that, and so on. And yet, when it's needed, it's nowhere. This is the incredible thing. I mean, the classic duties of government, taken, I believe, in order of precedence, of importance, defense of the nation, the provision of law and order, and a credible system of justice the encouragement of a growing economy, the maintenance of a sound currency. Those are classic and have been throughout history for the governments of any nations, whether dictatorships or democracies or what. The one new one that has been added, I believe, in this half century is the provision of good, in quotation marks, social services. This is really a 20th century addition to civilization. But good, I mean that social service money goes to where it's actually needed, rather than being sort of splashed across the page, buying votes and all this sort of thing. Good social service. And an example when we talk about a civilization where the leadership vacuum has existed, 
Just cast your mind back to uh, the October War of 1973, when suddenly the Western world, with the historic chief energy economies, was faced with a massive, thanks to the sort of charismatic leadership of King Faisal, an oil sellers cartel, which united the Arabs for the first time since Mohammed. And yet, instead, there we were, the Western world, the sophisticated oil companies and the sophisticated governments and everything else, totally unable, through lack of leadership, to get together and to face that seller's cartel with a buyer's cartel. What did we do? We fought amongst each other, even the individual oil companies fought amongst each other, to buy spot oil in the Rotterdam market, and they bid the price through the roof. And the Arabs just pegged higher and higher to these spot prices. And that is a classic example of the lack of leadership in the Western civilization at that time. Contrast this to a leader in a country, not habitually friendly with my own country, France. Think of the Mecca uprising in uh, November 79, when the Saudis were in real trouble. At the beginning, this, in the holiest of mosques of Islam, this revolution, this great sort of armed uprising, President Giscard d'Estaing of France called Prince Fahad straight away on the telephone, and really, I don't believe you, they are the best stormtroopers in the world. He said, we have the best stormtroopers in the world, and they're at your service. He not, didn't call a king and step over Prince Fahad, he called the managing director. And he offered his services. Of course, they were refused. The Saudis said, well, we, we can cope with the situation and so on. But of course, he said, well, call me back if there are any problems, because I can do it. Of course, the Saudi National Guard, the so-called Queen, was supposed to do this job. And of course, they'd been reading a lot of Audie Murphy type watching movies and so on. <laughs> Never faced this sort of problem in Saudi Arabia before. And these chaps rushed, some of them straight off vacation and reservists call up in their white tobes, armed with a sort of submachine gun, and just rushed at the mosque. And of course, were blown to pieces. And they sustained enormous casualties. And so eventually, the Saudis called the French. And Giscard d'Estaing provided these people. They drilled holes in the floor of the mosque and gassed these guys to death. And so they did the job, and they didn't break the mosque. They achieved everything the Saudi Arabians wanted with great secrecy and efficiency, and France got the contract for the Saudi Arabian Navy. Now that's the ability of leadership to be exercised and make a big difference to its national fortune in the economic and financial terms. Now, in the Western world, we, in our history books and in our history classes, we complain a lot about the old borough, rotten borough system in England, uh, where politicians bought the votes of uh, their voters. Well, the thing about it was that at least they paid their own cash. <laughs> Today, we have politicians all over the Western world buying voters' votes with the voters' cash, or most of the voters' cash. A great increase in taxation, then of borrowing, and then of inflation, which is the cruelest taxation of all, and the biggest contract of all. And look at the escalation. The Korean War in the United States financed out of tax. The Vietnam War in the United States financed out of borrowing. The result? Inflation. Then stop-go policies. And then the, the most difficult and the new problem which we all have to face of how do you bring down inflation when you don't just have inflation, when you have inflation and recession together in terms of stagflation. This is the real problem, and some really important differences from the past, structural differences. Now we're much more highly leveraged. Now our interest rates are floating, not fixed, by and large. So interest rates have a devastating impact, much more than before in traditional recessionary applications. And of course, we're all a little drunk, all of us, to one way or another, have adapted to inflation. We're all long of property, we're all long of assets. And suddenly we're going to move into an economy where cash is going to be king. And so we've suddenly got to stop playing uh, cricket and play baseball. Now some cricketers will be good at baseball, some will be hopeless, and some won't even try. 
And so, this game, it is, as you Chen said at the beginning, a big social change, as well as an economic change, that I believe uh, is possible, and indeed even desirable, if we're going to beat the enemy of inflation. We also have the problem in the West, where our leaders uh, don't act so much as they react. There are very few initiatives taken by Western leaders. They merely react in most of our countries to situations that face them in the office every day, the actions of someone else, whether it be a terrorist or a, a big Russian thing or a big trade problem or another nation strong under dictatorship or out of dictatorship or whatever. But it's just a series of reactions and very little action. And the initiative tends to lie with events rather than with men and in our case, with our enemies, rather than with our friends. And now, I believe that democracy itself, and by democracy I just don't mean our freedom, individually and as sovereign nations, but the standard of living that that freedom tends to engender in terms of free enterprise, is under threat or challenge. And I see the uh, division, the risk of under development or less development growing rather than development growing. What tended in history to divide the developed nations from the underdeveloped nations, or let's say those with a higher standard of living than other nations, well, you know, bearing in mind that it wasn't evenly distributed and some places it was and some places it wasn't, but just basic aggregates, was whether initially in the medieval times and beyond whether you had a, a good king or a good general who tended to beat or outwit the competition. And you either had uh, resources or slaves or whatever brought into your country and the standard of living and all the court-sponsored art and so on. Then you've got the real divisions coming for real reasons. The first, the two agricultural revolutions, the use of the enclosures and then the use of machines on the land. The two industrial revolutions, the heavy in, uh, industrial revolution and the light industrial revolution. And today's ball game. I see as the technological revolution. And I only see three countries really making it at the moment. The United States and Japan, following that, West Germany, and knocking on the doors, Switzerland. And until the change in government, I believe, even France was striving to knock on the door. Strangely enough, Great Britain a seat of a lot of technological inventiveness, was actually, in effect, shunning the technological revolution. So, I see this as very, very important. And I see the three great challenges facing the West in the 1980s as firstly defense and the management of nuclear proliferation. As secondly, the achievement of a technological revolution. And thirdly, the restoration of financial integrity. In other words, arresting inflation. But the great thing is how do you arrest inflation when it starts from a base of stagflation? And how do you attempt to do that in a democracy? Because arresting inflation is very painful and you have to be real -ex. Again, I believe the key is leadership. And I think there's an important difference between two types of political leaders in the democracies of the West. The first, what I term ambition politicians, are politicians who want to get the job as prime minister or president or minister or whatever else, because they just want it. They just want the power and the grandeur and all that goes with it. And the second, I term conviction politicians. Politicians who want to get the job and the power in order to do something with it for their country before themselves. And I would say in the recent past, examples of those conviction politicians would be people like Winston Churchill, De Gaulle, uh, your President Reagan, and Margaret Thatcher. Whether or not we like their policies, or we even think they're correct, or we even like them as individuals, the fact is, I believe pretty conclusively that they have the conviction and they have the political integrity to put their nation first, which is, to me, absolutely uh, key.
Now, modern, as a phil phil uh, economic philosophy, is a free market philosophy. And uh, it therefore requires a free market in which to work. And if it isn't given that free market, it's going to work either askew or not at all. In Britain, monetarism is working. It's working very effectively. Some would say devastatingly effectively. The problem is that we don't have a free market. And so it's been working very well just in one sector of the economy. And of course causing distortions. The other thing is that uh, monetarism is very painful. Severely painful. And a pain that's not short and sharp. The pain sustained over a year or two or even more. And one has, simply because, one's changing attitudes, and that takes time. The attitudes of assets into cash, I mean, real fundamental, basic attitude. So I believe in order for monetarism to be successful, the leadership has to be one of conviction, of one of courage to act rather than just react, and to act cleverly, ruthlessly, and fast particularly in a democracy with only a four-year span and with your case a sort of half-year, uh, two-year half span. And finally, that leadership needs charisma because the leadership has to sell umbrellas in the summer. It's got to sell an unattractive package and it's not just got to sell it first time, it's got to make replacement sales in order to keep the sustained action going because some of the grassroots people who vote for monetarism tend to be in the private sector. And of course, they're the ones who are often hit hardest. And so charisma, and again leadership, I believe are key. So much for the background. Let us just now look, if we may, at the British case. Early in 1979, the British government was in reality facing a situation in which it was just about to lose its internal sovereignty. I mean, it was as dramatic as that. A, an unbelievable situation which, you know, has rarely been seen in our history in the United Kingdom. And so I think that one is fair enough to say that my country in the United Kingdom is close to a last chance situation. But democracy is under threat, real threat. And the classic evolution of anarchy and then dictatorship, and if that happened, it would probably be extreme right or extreme left. Because 63 million people in Britain aren't just going to slide into the ocean. They're going to be there, and there'll be some form of government. And so the democracy is under threat. Now, what assets does the United Kingdom have? Briefly, I think, firstly, that it is a nuclear power. I mean, in defense terms, that's important. I mean, effectively, you can argue all the details of who would fire and who wouldn't fire, but the fact is, we, other than the United States, and of course much, much smaller, are the only country that could effectively hit Russia or cause Russia such pain that she wouldn't really want to attack us for anything but a very, very good reason. Um, in energy, we're energy rich. North Sea oil and gas and 300 years of coal reserves. We have good people. I really believe it. Tough and gentle. At the moment, idle, by and large, because they've been encouraged to be idle. They've even been paid to be idle. And this is a sad thing. I mean, good material just lying around rusting. And when people are idle, they get less sharp and less skilled and so on. And it, you know, it takes the rust has got to come off and the cobwebs and so on. But it's basically a tough and gentle and law-abiding people able to take orders if they're properly given. A technical base. I mean, we are, despite the fact we're shunning the technological revolution, very technically oriented in terms of research and the initial discovery, but we fail to exploit. I mean, just to think, just on the jet engine. I mean, jet engine, the first jet airliner, the, the first supersonic jet airliner, and so on. But I mean, we make losses, not gains. Uh, the Comet, and then you come in with the 740s to the 707, and that creams the market. The Concorde, and then it'll probably be some uh, titanium skin thing which will cream the, the then market, and so on. 
And above all, we have, and I mean one example in my constituency, the largest research facility in IBM outside the United States, and it's the third largest in IBM, is in my constituency. And these British people are working tens of a dozen round and round, creating great wealth for the shareholders of IBM. Some of them may be English, but the bulk are the United States. And yet ICL, the British company, the British management company, is getting larger and larger loans from the government. Technically bust. So properly led, it's got enormous potential. And for the first time, the final and greatest asset is that for the first time in 30 years, we really have a leader. A leader with conviction. First of all, her plus points. One obvious one, she's a woman. And of course, that's interesting, and it's a change. And I think psychologically, people, you know, they were desperate, and so almost anything that was a change <laughs> was a good thing. She's made her mark on history of being the first British Prime Minister, so she loses a bit of personal ambition, more prepared to put the country first. She's already made history. A lot of British Prime Ministers are spending 10 years still trying to make history. Just higher and higher unemployment things. <laughs> but um, she's made history already. And she's the wife of a very successful businessman with a very happy and successful family. So why is she Prime Minister? Not just for personal ambition. Similar to De Gaulle. He wasn't in it for himself. He was in it for France. And that is what you have with Margaret Thatcher. She has brains. She works hard. She's got enormous integrity. She uses integrity. I mean, her and the Queen, I would be absolutely lose my faith in all my ability of judging human beings if I found either of them involved in any sort of scandal whatsoever. And of course, she has courage. Real guts. In fact, in England, we all say she's the only man amongst them. And it's true. <laughs> she has guts and she fights like a cat. Really tough in close quarters. And uh, she's a conviction po uh, politician and she's a, a political base in a party that is suitable for this sort of restoration of financial integrity and for defense and for technological revolution. She's in the right party because it believes in these things. On the negative side, we have, unfortunately, also quite a lot of points. The first is, and this sounds very pompous, but I don't mean it in any pompous way, but it's a fact. She's not from the establishment. Now, to be a great leader of your people, or any company or whatever, but particularly a nation, and to change people's attitudes, it's relatively, it's difficult anyway. But it's relatively easier if you're already part of the power elite. If you're not from the power elite, it's not impossible. I mean, Hitler did it and Napoleon did it without being in the power elite. But whereas Winston Churchill was already part of the elite, you know, his school friends, his university friends, his regimental friends, were all big bankers, they were big in the court, they were big in the political parties of all parties, they were big in big business and small business, and, you know, diplomatic corps, they were powerful. And she, Margaret Thatcher, has no such friends. Her husband, successful businessman, but nothing to do with politics. And that was it. She had no university school friends and she wasn't in a regiment. And uh, so this is an important part because when we come to the crucial decision of making the cabinet, I hope you'll see the importance of it. The second thing is that Margaret Thatcher didn't get the job of being prime minister. She wasn't going for being prime minister. She had no ambition to be prime minister. She was the statutory woman on the board in the Conservative government. Pretty, clever, and hard-working. I mean, the ideal woman to have on the board. And the Conservative Party had done its bit for equal rights. And it looked good. Nobody dreamt, least of all her, that she would actually be the leader. And of course, you know, in England, just like in many other parts of the world, we talk about the importance of the individual, individual dignity, the rights of the individual. But when it comes down to it, you know, we've got pretty defined parameters in our mind of what those individuals have got to do and got not to do. And if they go outside those parameters, we're pretty anti-individualist. You know, I mean, if somebody came into this talk this evening just in a bikini, 
you know, we can do your own thing, wear a dinner day, we wear the light. But if the guest came with us in a bikini, A, we wouldn't like to be sitting next to them and seeing them as their host. But, you know, we might not even like to sit next to them even if we were their host. I mean, we're pretty anti-individualist, and no more so than in the Conservative Party in England. Winston Churchill was thrown out at a very early age by this civil mechanism. Thrown out of the Conservative Party, actually he left, went to the Liberal Party, and then became an independent. But when Britain, when the Conservative Party was up against the wall with a leadership crisis at the beginning of the Second World War, what did they do? They plucked the backbench independent rebel, Winston Churchill, right, and they made him leader of the Conservative Party. Similarly, Margaret Thatcher, although she wasn't a rebel, she just kept her mouth shut. But she wasn't considered. She didn't go through the suit. She didn't even put her in the suit, not at all question whether she was sipped out. But in a leadership crisis, they picked Margaret Thatcher from nowhere and put her in the hot seat. And this is the important thing, is that Margaret Thatcher didn't go out to get the job of Prime Minister. She was appointed as leader of the Conservative Party and then became Prime Minister. And she was appointed by a very interesting man, a chap called Airy Nee. Airy Nee was a grenadier officer in the war, one of the five prisoners to escape from the coldest prison camp, a war hero, a man of utterly ruthless operations, very patriotic, very tough, and very hard working, and a man who knew the conservative backbenches backwards. He could twist any arm, he knew he was a real king operator, a kingmaker, and a power operator in the Conservative Party. And it was him who selected Margaret Thatcher as the only man amongst them, the only person who would have the courage to do what he knew had to be done. He was very self-effacing, he wanted to operate from the back. And the irony was that when the election was called, through that big, the first defeat of the government in a central motion in England since, since 1832, and that's the collapse of the last government. He was shot in the house, he was bombed to death in the, in the House of Commons, assassinated. And of course, nobody really appreciated the importance of this to start with the, you know, grief and so on immediately, then the election was on, three days later. And of course, the euphoria, election fever and all that, and then the euphoria of victory, everybody had forgotten. I mean, even his memorial service hadn't happened, and everybody had forgotten about it. Because of what was going on. But when Margaret Thatcher, and this is my surmise, I can't say this is fact, but figuratively speaking, when Margaret Thatcher then won the election, the next day she went to Chequers to form her cabinet. She looks for her patron and finds an empty chair. So she, because she wasn't in the establishment, she does the classic thing, not daring to do the unusual. She puts out the book of etiquette of how to form a cabinet. And of course the first lesson is to pick your nearest contender and make sure he's silenced by being in the cabinet. So Willie Whitehill was called to help form the cabinet. And the guy who manipulates the back benches, the chief whip, the power broker of the Conservative Party, he was called in. Now both these men, Willie Whitehill and Humphrey Atkins, utterly patriotic and very loyal to Margaret Thatcher. But both of them in monetary terms, financial, I mean economic terms, dripping wet. And so, what she had, either by accident or by design, was she formed a cabinet in which, on the easy issues, she had 100%. I mean, cutting tax and doing you know, these sort of things, even doing monetarism in the private sector where there were just some muffled squeals. But anything that was difficult, like cutting into social welfare, cutting into government spending, budget cuts, and all, anything really difficult, she had less than half the cabinet. And including the outer government, the junior ministers, less than a third of the government. And so what happened was that what was put to the British Parliament was half monetarism, the easy side of monetarism. And bear in mind that the three power blocks in the British Parliament, the monarch, who still has significant power but has to sort of sting like a bee, you know, if she stings at the wrong time, she's dead. You swat it off and she's lost it. You know, it's not a wasp sting, it's a bee sting. So she's got great power. She's still commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Every officer, including the police, swear to the Queen and not to Parliament. Uh, she still has to sign every act. If she doesn't sign it and they want to extend Parliament, so Richard Bonner wants and she didn't sign it, it's illegal. She chucked the Prime Minister of Australia out five years ago. 
I mean, she's got power, and sometimes she uses it. People forget. And the significant thing about it is that what power the Queen has, even though she may never use it, prevents any other person in England having it. Which is an important fact when you think of the value of the monarchy. Nonetheless, she doesn't use it much. The House of Lords, virtually no power. The House of Commons, all the power. Far, far too much for health. And of course, an English Prime Minister, unlike your President, is in the Commons. And if he's in the Commons, he's either got a coalition or an overall majority. And so he's in effect, either by coalition or by straight election, and this was an overwhelming election, elected dictator. She can put through the House anything, and it goes straight up, and the Queen, I didn't, uh, this Queen has never not signed anything. So, you know, it's got a jolly good chance of going right through. The sad thing is that half monetarism uh, went through. The next thing was that she had an unusual cabinet. Not just in the numbers I've given you, but it was the first disloyal cabinet in the Conservative government for over a hundred years. Because an interesting phenomenon had happened. In the old days, pre Edward Heath, including Edward Heath, Conservative leaders evolved. This magic word in the democracy, but they evolved. And what that meant was the outgoing king, just in even Saxon times, or the outgoing prime minister as it was now, selected a few sort of candidates and bounced them off the power elite of Britain. The big bankers, the big businessmen, people in the Royal Court, people in the Conservative Association, the Central Office people in the Shahs and the Conservative Association, people in Parliament and the House of Lords, all the various bits of power, the trade unions, everything. And gradually this guy evolved. Now, all the competitors were usually in the cabinet. And the ground rules of the cabinet were this. You were loyal to the Prime Minister or the leader in opposition. You didn't leak to the press or the media. And if you disagree, you resign. And that was the conservative ethos. But now when Edward Heath had to have his... He played the gentleman's game but didn't play as a gentleman. When he failed, he refused to resign. So they had to devise a system to lift the reins of power from out of his fingers. And so they called the integrity of old Alec Douglas Hume back to design a system which he accepted. He didn't think anyone would challenge him. I would want to challenge him. It was over and so on. But what it resulted in was that now the conservative backbenchers, not all this mercurial power elite, select the leader of the conservative party. So all the cabinet ministers in England, in the conservative party, know precisely who the selection committee are. So they now can identify their own power blocks within the selection committee and play to them by disloyalties, by leaking to the press, and now not bothering to resign. And so Margaret Thatcher had this unusual and new occurrence also to contend with. And the last thing on the negative side uh, of her personally was the fact of charisma. Now, you know, some leaders, some people have an unknown quantity called charisma or quality. I mean, a Muhammad Ali, he hardly has to lay a punch. I mean, he's just a star. I mean, Prince Philip, when he plays a game, I mean, he, people just come to watch him. Yet the same number of people won't come and watch Prince Charles, who's actually going to be king. I mean, he's in a way more senior than Prince Philip. But Prince Philip has star quality. And so has Muhammad Ali. Instantly, before they even fight. A chap like Sonny Liston wasn't a great star. But his fan club was built up by results, by just winning fights. Now, I wouldn't like in any way, either by looks or uh, integrity, to liken why we captured the sign list. But <laughs> what I'm saying is this, that I think your President Reagan has a great ability to communicate with people. He's more of a Muhammad Ali type of charisma. Margaret Thatcher has a problem. She's a woman, she's a fair-haired woman, she's got an upstage voice, she's a conservative, she's a right-wing conservative. And, you know, those are a lot of disadvantages in mass communication in Britain. And so she's got a, a sort of Sonny Liston problem. She's got to win and show results before her fan club really starts to rise. Now, of course, she did. She won the general election and had a lot of charisma. But she didn't realize so much, I don't think, that her charisma was of a temporary type. And when the results didn't come, it had to ask. And now she's desperate to show more results. And so this is the situation we now have in Britain. A cabinet 
that has delivered to Parliament half monetarism. The easy stuff. And the difficult stuff. I mean, the public sector, we're 200% over budget on the nationalised industries now, at this minute. Two billion sterling was the budget, it's now going to be six billion sterling. The payment to the state-owned monopoly industries. That's just one example. We failed to create a free market for monetarism to work in. The employment cartel still operates with massive, very undemocratic unions, you know, and officers elected for life, you know, and all these sort of strange uh, things that go on. Undemocratic unions, very big, and powerful, who with state-owned monopolies, not just state-owned companies, but monopoly companies, who can afford to pay any wages demanded, and on the other side charge the customer any price, because they're in a monopoly. Monetarism can't work in that sort of atmosphere, at all. And how can democratic government, even ministers, hardly have the courage to take on these kind of things, singularly? But as a mass, they could have done it, and they failed. I ended up myself leading the largest rebellion in the Conservative Party since 1956. And I hadn't even been in Parliament a year. On the subject of the secret ballot, we were giving it only to the trade union leaders. The very guys who caused the problem. It's not the union members that caused the problem. It's their leaders who are the Trotskyists and want to break the system and all that sort of thing. And we were just going to give more power to them by giving them a voluntary secret ballot, but not extend it to the people on the shop floor, which were the people who really needed the voluntary secret ballot. And so, monetarism has been half successful. The differential in the British economy was when Margaret Thatcher came in, the private sector was suffering unduly against the public sector. And now, instead of being narrowed, that differential has been increased. And of course, her grassroots support, even the money given by private business to her party and so on, <coughs> is squealing in a big way. And funds are even uh, falling off. And so, this is the big problem. You look at things like interest rates, you know, half measure, they didn't go up high enough. Now they're not low enough. You know, where you might expect two and a half or three percent above the rate of inflation to be the interest rates. I mean, we're six to eight percent above the rate of inflation, the effective rate of interest to industry. Now to compare, that's just looking at the British problem, which is serious. Now, taking this and looking at America, as I said, there are some superficial, tremendous similarities. I mean, you know, we all speak English, and as uh, Oscar Wilde, I think it was, so we're provided by a common language. I mean, you can get into embarrassing situations speaking English words in America uh, sometimes. And um, so, you know, these similarities, when looking through, I find only two real similarities out of uh, ten major points that I think are important. The first is, the leadership style of the leaders. First of all, accepting, uh, I believe, that leadership is key. Well, the leadership style and much of the leadership is very similar. Just the difference in the charisma is, is the big difference. Secondly, the mandate. In both cases, overwhelming election mandate. Whether people knew what they were voting for or not, it's not a matter. But, I mean, the mandate appeared to, in both countries to be overwhelming. And so, with some justification, both Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan could say, I really was voted to do this. And then we come to the differences, or the, I see the differences, and some would think very similar. First of all, the civil service. In the United States, you have the ability, as Prime President, to appoint political appointees into the service and into the bureaucracy. In England, you don't. Very, very limited. Some, but they're over time, like the Supreme Court judgment. Uh, it takes a long time, and basically you don't. And Margaret Thatcher has been sabotaged in a big way by the bureaucracy. A big way. Take just two little examples, one little and one big. My local village in the country, the library has been closed on a Saturday morning, not a Wednesday morning. Saturday, everybody's kicking and mad about it. Wednesday, only about five people would have noticed the light and the power was left on in schools during the winter to make the cuts fail. So she's been deliberately sabotaged by people. The second is British Railways, another state monopoly, where she ordered them to sell off these great tracts of railway yards in the 
downtown areas of big cities. Highly valuable stuff for new industries to start warehousing and building factories or sales offices or whatever on relatively low cross land right in the centers of communication. They resisted and resisted so they sold very little. And what they have sold has been so leasehold and not freehold. So again, real sabotage from the, uh, the civil service. The fourth point is the trade unions. Whereas I believe your trade union leaders are really interested, well, let's say more interested than ours in the real welfare of their members. But even having said that, slightly cynical statement, but I believe it's true, they see that they're capitalists. They're unions, trade union leaders, in a capitalist free enterprise world. And they see that to get a deal, or even to stay in office and thereby show their chaps they've done a good job and thereby stay in office, that the, the cake has got to grow. It's not just a question of getting more of the cake. They actually see the advantage of the cake growing as well. Now, in Britain, we don't have capitalist oriented trade unions fighting their corner for their union members. We have, on the, by and large, we have one or two, but by and large, socialist trade union leaders. And even who don't see the, they didn't even see it that the cake's got to get bigger. They just think they want more and more. Percentage count. But worse than that, we have Trotsky's trade union. And they're not interested either in the government, the country, or their members. They want to break the political system. And so that's a very different thing than you've got here. The cooperation you'll ever get out of the trade unions uh, by negotiation rather than by using levers of power. The fifth point is the public sector. In Britain, over 60% of the economy is owned by the public sector. And yours is much, much less than that. And not only is it owned, but as I've said before, in many crucial areas, it's a monopoly. So no competition. So the post office makes so-called vast profits and keeps patting itself on the bed, on the back. But there's nowhere else to go. They can charge whatever they like for a call. And we have made very little inroads into breaking them. The sixth point is resources. The United States vastly rich by world standards. I mean, as a nation, this is a heck of a rich nation. I mean, if you really muscled up. Whereas Britain has been shrinking behind its competitors by one or two percent for 30 years or more. And now we've reached the bottom of the bow. We've just got the, sta the clothes we stand up in. And so we can't afford a change of clothes. And we can't, we can't afford mistakes. But, you know, we're up against the wall. And that is a big difference. The, uh, the seventh point is the percentage of world trade that your economy uh, is in your economy. In the United States, it's about 6 to 8% of your trade is involved in the world economy. I think that through the oil cartel, the failure of the Western leadership to get together in the mid-70s and the early 70s, this year alone, the OECD will be paying to the OPEC countries $150 billion. Now, that's all goods and services withdrawn from our economy. And very little of it is actually recycled in terms of demand for goods and services. The bulk goes into the banks in very short-term instruments and is geared up and on length to the third world with a mismatch in credits and a mismatch in maturity, increasing financial risk. And so with that, on top of monetary policies and the problems we've got about stagflation, it's a big problem for world trade. And the North-South Dialogue and these things, you're just 6%, 6 to 8% of all. Well. We are 54% of our GNP generated by trade abroad. You can see that we're less able to be masters of our own uh, destiny. The eighth point is socialism. Again, very similar to the, the thing I said about the trade union leaders. You're basically free enterprise still and capitalist orientated, where tax incentives actually work. I mean, I've just come back from Denver, Colorado, and you, you find people who last year were buying tax shelters now investing in business. I mean, productive business. Whereas they were buying losses before. Unproductive business. And uh, in Britain, after 30 years of socialism, I mean, the mouse doesn't even want to put his paw out of the tract, uh, out of its hole to get the cheese. But alone his head and his whole body. They've been punched up. 
So the tax, dropping the tax rates, the marginal tax rates, have much less effect than they will have, I believe, in the United States. And of course it takes time. People, the media expect the tax cuts to have an immediate effect. And they told everybody that the monetary, the budget cuts aren't going to work. We only started today. <laughs> I mean, it's just incredible. And we've had the same problem with the press. That's one similarity that there is, where it's been killed by the press before it even started. The ninth point is time. Again, I've illustrated this already. You know, you've got the pace setter out in front of you. We've had to do it first, and you can learn some lessons. And the big lesson is, the one that Margaret Thatcher tried to tell President Reagan, is get it done fast, the front end, the difficult stuff, because you won't get a second bite of the cherry. Now, Margaret Thatcher, two and a half years into her government, is now worried about her backbenches mutiny and stopping her dictatorial role in Parliament. President, and that takes time to happen because the Conservative Party is a pretty loyal and disciplined party. Two and a half years, and you know, she's got some worries, but not too severe yet. But President Reagan, who doesn't sit in the Congress and doesn't necessarily have a majority in either house, but just happens to have in the Senate, but with a much less tight whipping system in your Senate and your representatives, he's got reason to worry almost immediately the fight starts because grassroots people tell their congressmen and, and their senators, and these guys don't want to cooperate very quickly. The reaction time in the States against monetarism in Parliament 